Thanks everyone for joining. This is uh, Securing a Medical Device Network on a Shoestring Budget uh, by uh, Helen and myself, Matt McMahon, will be your presenters today. Uh, this will be uh, recorded, uh, pre-recorded and streamed, um, but we will be available on Discord to answer any questions. So um, just a little bit of an intro in the class. Uh, this initially was a four hour course and, and we cut it down. So. Um, we, we will be trying to cover a good amount of uh, topics in, in a little bit of a short time, but um, it will be recorded and played again, so are available again on YouTube. So if you need to get up to get a drink or use the restroom, feel free to do that and come back and you can uh, look at any parts that you missed afterwards. So just to kind of give a, a quick synopsis of where this training came from. So Helen and I both work for a cyber or work for a uh, medical device company uh, in their cybersecurity group. Um, we're also both uh, either, either current or former uh, adjunct professors teaching courses in cybersecurity, healthcare, digital forensics, and things like that. Um, so we thought this would be a really good class um, for, for, for hospitals to, to kind of understand some of the basics. So this is you know, a totally free course, uh, open to anyone, and we're really just looking to share knowledge. Uh, so a note on our target audience. Uh, we developed this course initially for the target audience being like a small critical access, like 25 bed hospital um, with a smaller IT staff and a kind of a limited budget. Um, they may not have any secure, uh, cybersecurity staff, um, you know, uh, currently on the, on, in the workforce. So, you know, there, there will be things that uh, larger hospital organizations or other individuals can get out of this course, but if uh, some of the material, at least in the beginning, seems kind of basic, just kind of bear with us. We're trying to set the stage uh, so that, you know, the, uh, that target audience can can pick up and kind of follow us for the whole course. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to have six different agenda or six different distinct modules. So I'll start with the uh, healthcare threat landscape today. Uh, then Helen will take over for basic network security within the hospital, uh, network monitoring and scanning, developing and regular patching strategies. Uh, and then I'll take back over at the end for physical security uh, and then vetting of third parties. Um, we will then have a, a short break um, and then we'll come back for a panel discussion, both with Helen and myself and a number of other um, experts from the hospital cybersecurity space. So stay, you know, make sure to come back for that. As I said before, this training is pre-recorded. So we are, while we're teaching, we're not teaching right now. This was pre-recorded. So we are able to answer questions uh, on the Discord uh, channel. Um, and be aware too that we do have that panel afterwards. So um, if there's a question specifically on how a hospital may do something, um, we may defer to the panel just because uh, then you'd be able to actually hear from hospital staff on, on how they would uh, handle certain situations. So just to kind of start off and set the stage, um, it's important before you really can secure or defend anything, you kind of need to know your current threat landscape. And certainly healthcare is a little bit different uh, than some other threat landscapes. So a lot of the data that we'll be pulling from, uh, the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, uh, obviously that comes out each year. There's a lot of good data that comes with it. Uh, but there's another report called the Protected Health Information Data Breach Report. It takes the DBI, DBIR's uh, data specifically just on healthcare in the healthcare sector uh, related to data breaches. It takes those stats over the course of three years and, and extrapolates some data um, from just the healthcare sector. So we'll be talking a lot about um, information from those those reports. Uh, PHI, this, I mean, this is probably uh, not not anything new to anyone that's currently working in the field, but uh, just in case you don't know, uh, medical record, why is it valuable? It could potentially sell for you know 10 to 20 times uh, on the on the um, black market what a credit card record could sell for. You can't turn off a, a PHI record, protected health information record, like you can a, a credit card. Um, an attacker could potentially use the stolen data to acquire expensive medical tech uh, equipments or technology. And then an attacker could also combine PHI uh, with a provider number to file fraudulent insurance claims. Just very quick, uh, some possible things that, that could happen. One of the things that makes the threat landscape in healthcare really unique is the, the prevalence of insider threats. And, and um, when we say insider threats, we typically think of malicious insider threats, but healthcare is unique in that um, there's a lot of error that factors into that as well. So non-malicious errors and um, 
data breaches as a, as a result of that. Uh, in healthcare, 58% of data breaches over the course of those three years that were recorded um, did have some insider component. Again, both malicious and non-malicious, but uh, that is important to note. Uh, it's the only critical infrastructure sector in the United States that you're actually more likely to be compromised internally than externally. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're taking into account that. So what's the breakdown of some of the threats? So we talked, you know, I said, you know, some of this were uh, non-malicious, so a lot of it is error. Uh, you can see over 30%, 33.5% uh, is just error. So, you know, individual staff, maybe clinical staff working long hours, swing shifts, uh, too many patients uh, than they would normally have, certainly in the COVID era. Um, working with technology that they might not be familiar with, it, it's easy to make a mistake uh, and cause a data breach that way. Misuse would be the second highest, uh, just under 30%. Uh, misuse in this case would have a deliberate uh, component. So, you know, it could be as simple as nurse A tells nurse B, hey, did you hear about this patient? Um, you know, and nurse B shouldn't have access to that patient, or it could be selling hundreds or thousands of records. Um, so it, there's a broad spectrum there. Uh, physical, we'll touch on a little bit. Um, and what's what's interesting with this graph, I think, is, is you see, you know, if you look on the news with, or just search cybersecurity and healthcare, pretty much so what you're going to see is, you know, a lot about ransomware. And certainly we'll talk about ransomware, um, you know, in, in this presentation about how prevalent it is um, and how it's becoming much more prevalent. Um, but it's just important if you're trying to defend the hospital's network to kind of know where your threats are really coming from. Certainly you want to defend against uh, you know, quote unquote hacking or uh, malware, ransomware. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're aware of the fact that, uh, you know, our largest um, uh, threat landscape or our, lar our largest threats might actually be already inside the building, someone that we've actually given access to. So if we dive down into those errors, again, over 30%, um, misdelivery was the biggest. Uh, so, you know, sending PHI somewhere where it wasn't intended to go to. Um, disposal error, so we, we think we've properly cleared a device, uh, or this could be paper records as well. Uh, loss, we, we just lost the data, we didn't know where it went to. Um, publishing error, publishing error typically would be like a study. So we've released a study that we think had anonymized data, that data was able to be uh, de-anonymized and they were able to uh, basically, basically resulted in a data breach. What I find interesting about this is um, that there was a quote in the report that said that healthcare has a, a paper problem. You know, typically when you think data breach, we think electronic, but 43% of all the data breaches that were recorded were actually still on paper. So, um, you know, moving to electronic could actually reduce the overall data breaches. Uh, data misuse. So, you know, again, misuse required that distinct motive. It could be as simple as nurse A tells, tells nurse B, hey, you know, your uh, ex-significant other is in the hospital. Did you hear about it? Um, or it could be selling records. Um, and let's see. And, and typically this, evolved, this involved at least two-thirds of privilege, privilege abuse. So accessing data that they shouldn't have access to, um, maybe escalating their own privileges. Physical, uh, physical was pretty close to 100%, over 95% just stolen unencrypted laptops. Um, if this was a doctor's laptop that was uh, stolen but encrypted, they don't include that as a you know potential data breach just because they assume that um, an attacker wouldn't be able to get to that data. Uh, but if the data is not encrypted, then they assume that they are able to get get to that. So. Um, yeah, interesting with this picture, um, you know, that while the attacker did break the window and steal the unencrypted uh, laptop full of PHI, they did at least leave the fudge strips, so that's nice. Uh, quote unquote hacking, um, this is kind of a broad, broad category, but this included uh, almost 50% was phishing, social engineering, um, and, and again, just try to remember that uh, this is below 15% of the overall uh, data breaches. So again, we're just talking about data breaches here, not necessarily um, cyber attacks that bring down hospital networks, but spe uh, specifically data breaches. Uh, and breaking that down, so just under 50% of that was using uh, stolen credentials that were harvested. Again, you know, potentially from phishing or social engineering. Uh, over 20% was brute forcing a password. Um, 17.9%, so almost 18%, was uh, using a backdoor on a device. Could be a medical device, could be software, you know, whatever whatever that backdoor is. Uh, then you see, you know, minimal for the other ones. 
malware. So uh, general category of malware is just under 11%. Again, kind of keep in mind the, the prevalence of that to internal error uh, and 70, over 70% 70 of that was specifically ransomware. So obviously that's um, a factor. So while we, while I am trying to highlight the fact that, you know, insider threat is statistically a lot bigger uh, for data breach, uh, data breaches within the healthcare sector, obviously, you know, malware, um, th there is certain caveats that we need to talk about. It is certainly increasing. Um, this was an interesting report that came up uh, from NTT Security. They published a report uh, back in, it's a little bit dated now, but Q2 of 2016. They looked at their entire, uh, so their security company, they looked at their entire uh, customer portfolio. 7.4% uh, of their customers, only 7.4% of their customers were hospitals, uh, but those hospitals made up 88% of their clients that were affected by ransomware. So it really said, wow, you know, while uh, hospitals make up a small percentage of our actual customer base, they're disproportionately affected by ransomware. And we'll certainly get in, in this class as to, you know, why that is. Uh, flat networks, um, lack of uh, proper um, security controls, things like that. Uh, and it was predicted that uh, ransomware attacks in the healthcare sector uh, would quadruple in 2020. And certainly we've seen a, uh, an increase in that. All right, um, COVID-19, we can't really have a talk now and not talk about COVID-19. So um, certainly that's uh, changed the threat landscape as well. Um, not just in healthcare, but across the board, we've seen a 667% increase in COVID-19 related email attacks uh, just from February to June. Uh, and then just cyber attacks in general up 30, uh, 37% in May. Um, and what's interesting with, with COVID too, is we're not just seeing uh, cyber attacks, but we're also seeing a lot of fraud. Um, Interpol has seized over $14 million worth of fake PPE. And certainly hospitals have been caught with, um, you know, purchasing or trying to purchase uh, PPE uh, in the past when it was a little bit harder to get. Um, and maybe they had to front, um, you know, front funds to get those and then they just never got their equipment. So um, there's a lot of different possibilities there for compromise. Uh, for folks that work in the cybersecurity and healthcare uh, space or industry, this was an interesting report that came out in March. Basically, basically a number of ransomware shops said that uh, no, we won't uh, we won't specifically target healthcare the healthcare sector or hospitals during a uh, or, you know during a pandemic because that would be incredibly uh, bad. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case. Uh, they they still have continued um, you know to attack the healthcare sector. And in many cases, it's actually increased. So we've so we've seen, uh, or Health ISAC has reported an increase in COVID-19 themed attacks, uh, up 20 to 30 percent, and just phishing, specifically at, uh, targeting the healthcare sector. Um, and you can see there the, the average ransom payments. Uh, and obviously, w during a pandemic, there's a lot of things that kind of make make this more difficult. Um, obviously getting physical access to a device, if it's in a quarantined area to be able to update it, if you need to physically access the device to, to update something, you know, that's that, that just adds an extra layer of um, issue. So how many hospitals do we know of that have actually been attacked? Um, or, or been compromised by, by ransomware, um, specific, uh, specifically using a COVID-19 hook. Um, according to Bill Siegel, the CEO of uh, Coveware, it, it, there's been at least half a dozen just in the US. There's probably significantly more than that, but those are the ones that we're aware of. Um, there is certainly a, a good amount of underreporting. It's diff difficult to really understand the scope. Um, hospitals, in a lot of cases, pay the ransom. Um, it may not be reported if it's, you know, the, we don't believe that there's a data breach. So it's hard to tell the exact number, but we know of at least half a dozen in the U.S. Uh, in Canada, the Canadian government um, a uh, hospital there was affected. Um, it, it was specifically targeted uh, using a spoofed email that uh, appeared to look it looked like it came from the World Health Organization. It was procurement related. So this was a couple months back when procurement of you know, gloves, masks, things like that were, were quite difficult. Um, and if you read the, read the email, it was really kind of easy to spot if you knew what you were looking for. They, they really, the authors really didn't make any attempt to make it look legit in any way, but um, because of the, the need for procurement materials at that point, again, gloves and masks, um, it was clicked on and um, propagated. Uh, Spain, Spain at, at that time, 
um, was particularly hard hit uh, by COVID-19 and it, the Spanish hospital was hit by the NetWalker ransomware. Uh, it specifically targeted Spanish hospitals, uh, specifically during the peak of the virus there, uh, using a malicious, malicious attachment. Uh, Czech Republic as well. Um, Berno, I believe how that's saying it. I hope that's not incorrect. Uh, University Hospital, which is the second largest hospital in the Czech Republic, uh, was taken offline. It was uh, forced to shut down. Um, and it was, this attack was very, um, very WannaCry-esque. Um, Uh, so not just really hospitals, but we're also looking at laboratories and supply chains. So uh, in California, the 10X Genomics Company uh, was hit by COVID-19 or COVID related or themed ransomware. Uh, a urology uh, consultant company was hit. Medical device manufacturers have been hit. So why target healthcare? Um, well, hospitals, as we said earlier, uh, unfortunately often pay the ransom. Uh, there is a need to be online. Uh, the, these, these technologies are life and death. Um, and often they have less resources to be able to defend themselves. So it's, it might be easier to, um, uh, to attack a hospital. So some quick key takeaways. Um, privilege and escalation abuse was two thirds of all of the incidents. Um, now, um, having been someone that worked for a hospital uh, for a while, um, doing application access and, and having to monitor uh, access, I, I can certainly say that this is, um, this is difficult. Uh, if it, in a lot of this really depends on kind of how those individuals are um, keeping access. Certainly you want to restrict access as much as possible. You don't want to leave it open. Uh, but in the case, in my case anyway, it was, uh, it was certainly noted that um, the application support staff were working on call on the weekends and they were not being paid to work on call. So if you're doing that, you're basically creating a situation that um, encourages or incentivizes your uh, IT staff to leave access more broadly uh, open than it probably needs to be so that they're not getting a call at you know, 11 o'clock 11 at night during shift change when uh, new nurses come on, maybe um, you know, temporary nurses um, that need access. So just kind of think about that, maybe how, you, uh, how your hospital staff, or hospital IT staff or application support staff um, you know, have to deal with access? Do you have someone that's you know, constantly working or is it, uh, is it on call? It certainly comes into play. Um, data mishandling. So this was you know, kind of a, a cultural problem that we were talking about where you know, nurse A tells nurse B, hey, did you hear about this individual? Um, this was almost 17% of the data breach cases. So you know, something to kind of consider. Um, it's, certainly it's human nature, curiosity, so it's difficult, but something to consider. Um, fraud in the healthcare sector. There is a, a, a large amount of fraud in the healthcare sector. It's the third highest um, industry for fraud in the United States, uh, right behind the government sector and, and finance was number one. Um, breach discovery is also an issue within healthcare. Uh, approximately one third of the data breaches in the three year study um, were not discovered for years. Another third were not discovered for months. So it's important to kind of note that, um, you know, it, it, you, when you're looking at the numbers or, or considering if you've been breached, um, you know, many hospitals may not even be aware of it. So, um, and just one of the things that kind of complicates this budgeting and staffing realities, it's commonly cited by CISOs uh, from hospitals that 3% of the hospital budget goes towards IT um, and 3% of that 3% goes to security. So they really don't have a lot of, um, you know, the, either the staff or the resources uh, that they need to, to dedicate to, to security. So that's really kind of leads into one of the reasons why we built this course to try to offer some, you know, free technology, um, in this case, free training um, in, or low cost technology that uh, could be used to secure a, a hospital's network. Um, another issue is, is the, what's called agency staff. So at any given hospital, up to 10% um, of the uh, nurses could potentially be agency staff. So if someone calls in, we need someone to you know, take their shift. Um, they call the agency, they get a nurse. Uh, that person then has to be added to all the hospital systems. Uh, certainly, if, if you're working in IT at a hospital, please fight the urge to just create entries in your system uh, called agency nurse one, two, or three. Uh, it certainly makes it easier uh, for IT staff, but obviously, you know, for logging and things like that, um, it, it could be a bit of a nightmare. So just kind of be aware of that. 
Uh, just some quick insights from the 2009 HIMSS report uh, of all of the hospitals uh, that were surveyed. Over the course of, of the last 12 months, 82% of hospitals said that they didn't have a recent significant security uh, incident. So um, kind of good to note of the prevalence of how much this is happening. Uh, legacy systems are also an issue. 72% uh, of hospitals said that up to between 1% and 10% of their technology uh, is outdated legacy tech. And then if you look at 2016, uh, the 2016 HIM study, it, it interviewed or looked at 200 different hospitals, but I believe a third of those, or no, I shouldn't say hospitals, 200 different medical facilities, but a third of those were um, like doctor's offices and smaller offices. So certainly those, that third skewed the stats a little bit. So you can kind of factor that in when you're looking at these numbers, uh, but it's still a little bit scary to even think that those, um, even if it's a like an outpatient clinic or a, a doctor's office, that numbers would be this high. So 14% of those medical facilities lacked uh, any antivirus or malware, um, under 20%, no firewall protections, 46%, no network monitoring, 52%, no intrusion uh, prevention, and 41% didn't encrypt data at rest. Again, this is 2016. Um, HIMSS doesn't ask the same questions every year, so we can't see trends, um, but just kind of something to take into account. Um, so this is the last slide of this, uh, you know, and again, just to kind of talk about our objective, we're really trying to train those small critical access uh, hospitals on uh, some of the things that uh, they can do to help uh, bolster their cybersecurity um, uh, posture. And this is what's up next. So uh, Helen will be taking over next with uh, basic network security. Thanks for that, Matt, and for really just setting the uh, table here. I wanted to go ahead and, and preface that in the interest of time, I've removed uh, demos, but I've added a slew of links on uh, added resources, places where you can get demos, uh, and just manuals and the like to the end of this presentation. The, all the decks will be available to whomever would like them. I also included uh, any slides that I removed in order to streamline this presentation and uh, hit our time restraint. I include them in that slide deck so if you have and with my notes. So if you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and, and look through that and then, then reach out to me or Matt. We're going to start with the little parts of, of network security, you know, cyber hygiene and um, just the basics. As Matt said, the 2019 HIMSS study shows the importance of the network, of network security bases, um, basics. A pattern of cybersecurity threats are discernible across U.S. healthcare organizations, and as Matt had has just said, uh, the trend has only increased in the current pandemic era. Elements of network security, there are so many. I have asked this question of other people, and uh, everybody can give you, you know, 20 talking points of things that they find to be the, the core of network security. Here are some of those elements. We're going to talk about access management, segmentation, we'll go a little bit into uh, firewalls, and we'll finish up with some testing. Now, we're not just uh, coming up with network security requirements out of the air. Uh, there is HIPAA support, there is uh, industry support, hospitals need to protect their sensitive data. Uh, network security for the uninitiated and overworked, uh, I, I understand that it's really difficult, but Hopefully with this primer, you'll be armed with the tools to at least ask the right questions of your external consultants or Dr. Google. Strong access management is key. You want to secure your endpoints, ensure your remote workers use a VPN. 
you want to have strong but manageable passwords. Um, you want to use multi-factor when applicable or possible. I understand that it is very common in a lot of workflows in a hospital staff to use their badge already for access. So having them switch to badge and pin is not a stretch. It would be within a normal workflow. Um, physical controls to limit access to restricted areas are a must, and Matt will get to those later. You want to re review administrative accounts access to servers and workstations and devices. You don't want local admin accounts that can lead to unintended privilege uh, access to systems or data. You don't want generic lab user one. Uh, you, you really want to know who is accessing your data and why. Review the process uh, for elevating um, access as a request and make sure that there's a separation of duty policy for administrative access. Review shared accounts for necessity and then monitor out for abnormalities or misuse. And uh, finally, you want to re review your terminated employees or people that are on leave of absence. If those, ac if those accounts are not terminated, um, quickly, they can be used um, inappropriately. The principle of least privilege is uh, one of the one of the uh, basic principles of uh, user access. You don't want one master user that has all the keys to the kingdom. If that user has, um, is compromised, you are compromised. You don't want one person performing every duty. You want to spread those duties around. And you want to have more than one person accessing an area. With that in mind, sorry. I do want to start this over. <laughs> that was the concept of separation of duty. Not the least privilege. The concept of least privilege is that uh, you want to have the the user have the minimum access needed to do their job. Uh, network segmentation. Network se segmentation is the practice of dividing larger computer networks into several smaller sub networks. Um, that are each isolated from one another. So if you think of this like a fence around your house, if you have a fence around your house and you don't have any other protection to keep your house from being broken into, all somebody needs to do is find a way to get in through your fence, right? Um, so that's what you would have, even if you just have one firewall or one access um, area of protection. If you are creating a bunch of smaller networks, a, a smaller segments, even if one area is compromised, the other areas can remain protected. Here are some examples of uh, what a flat network looks like, and that's what we have seen in a lot of hospitals. You have the internet and everyone can access the internet and all the uh, equipment runs on the same network and it's almost set up like a home network, but in a business that runs, that, that deals with such sensitive information. Uh, the next slide, the next picture is a basic um, segment and here is an idea of what uh, segmentation in hospitals looks like. Here are, um, so a VLAN is a logical partition in the layer two network. And here's a background of, of what a switch would look like. And um, some ideas of, of what the logical, um, layout would look like. So I have removed a section on types of firewalls. 
there are several types of firewalls and uh, you should look to find which kind suit your purpose. Uh, there is some great information out there. I've included that in our resources at the end. Uh, firewalls are your first line of defense for securing healthcare networks from against the public. Uh, firewalls are digital walls that stand between protected health data and potentially dangerous uh, threat actors. You want to start by blocking all by, by blocking all traffic by default and then only allowing specific traffic to identified services. This approach provides quality control over traffic and decreases the possibility of breach. You're going to want to make changes slowly over time and I understand that um, sometimes this is uh, impractical but you want to do this in small segments and uh, secure your network over time during downtime and maintenance zones, maintenance, maintenance periods. Um, so the approach of quality control over traffic uh, can be achieved by controlling the last rule in an access control list to deny all traffic. And this can be done explicitly or implicitly depending on the platform. Um, sorry. This, uh, sorry. Um, so you follow an established set of rules firewall, and then firewalls can actively monitor incoming and outgoing traffic. In doing so, a firewall blocks the secure network from the internet, only allowing pre-clear -pre data to pass. So uh, you want to know the firewall's purpose, what the affected um, devices are, what users have access, what date your rule applied, and who's the name of the person who added the rule. Some inbound rules are whitelists, um, which are falling out of favor and um, are being called a loud list or a few other terms, um, which will be, you know, only um, allowing Jim and Mary to go to the insurance billing information website. Um, you, these are who's allowed to access an area. Uh, there's a deny list, which is um, the, you want, you can go ahead and allow these doctors to go anywhere except ratemymd.com. You don't want them reading reviews and getting upset on shift. <laughs> um, you want to block, so you're not going to allow one person access to anything. Um, whatever the thing you're saying, okay, this guy is in um, environmental services. He doesn't need to access financial records. That's blocked altogether. And then a VPN. So you say, okay, you're only going to allow this physician that works from home to, to access our network if they're using our approved uh, remote access avenue. SANS has some great firewall information. I'll have links to that in the resources at the end of my deck. Um, and they have a firewall checklist. The main purpose of the firewall is to drop all traffic that is not explicitly permitted as a safeguard to stop uh, uninvited traffic from passing through a firewall. You want to place a drop any, any, well, an any, any, any drop rule. It's a cleanup rule. So if you forget about something, this default rule will clean it up. Um, you want to have this at the bottom of each security zone. And uh, this will provide a, just a catch-all uh, catch mechanism for capturing traffic. Here's an example of what a cleanup rule would look like. It's also important to note that with all of this, you need robust documentation and a strict change procedure. Firewalls rules will need to be updated for any new service or new devices. They're going to have changes over time. But before adding or changing or removing any rules, you want to implement a formal change procedure that can make sure you're keeping track of the modifications. 
So here are some guidelines for those um, procedure, uh, change procedures. I know um, automation is a important topic and uh, automation is definitely possible with firewalls configuration for rules for management of your fleet. Uh, you can manage Windows firewalls versus via um, domain group policies. You can use configuration management for traditional firewalls. Um, you can use something like Rancid. Um, Linux has uh, web-based tools for to manage um, network router switches, firewalls, etc. Um, you can have a fleet managed uh, software. So, you know, like certain vendors will have their own tools to manage their fleets. And uh, it's the same with wireless access points. So you'll want to pick the management tool that works for your particular network. When uh, working in Windows, you can manage all the firewalls via domain, group domain policies. Um, Here's the Linux note and the, the other item that I just mentioned. Testing. So it's not enough to assume that you've applied ac uh, adequate security controls. Um, you want to make sure that you test different aspects of security, um, either for compliance, you might have a, a customer or a patient that has questions and if they're a large donor or something, you might be motivated enough to uh, test this. Uh, there, there might be a need for some sort of full red team engagement uh, or overall whatever you want to do to accept to assess risk readiness and it is important to, to pick a strategy and there's there's different levels of depth here. Uh, there's the vulnerability scanning or security scanning um, which is automated. There are several tools out there for this. And it's to get an idea of basic weaknesses. So are there patches that haven't been applied yet? Uh, are there area ports open that might be suspicious? What's the idea of traffic going on right now? It gives you an idea of your risk in an automated way. So you don't have to have an extra resource devoting time to that. It does not by any means replace more robust security measures, but it is a way to get an idea of what's going on and, and what weaknesses you may have. Um, a pen test is more in depth. It, it involves a person uh, simulating uh, different types of attacks in order to find as many vulnerabilities as possible. They will provide you with a report and depending on if you're what the agency you're going with to do this or what kind of your, your internal testers, uh, what their process is, they may also help you find remediations for that. Uh, risk assessments are more either enterprise risk management or uh, sometimes compliance related. It's a process of reviewing and analyzing potential risks that later you can prioritize and get business input on um, and you're going to try to come up with a plan as uh, to, uh, to see what the possible ways of preventing these uh, risks from becoming a reality. So you're going to prioritize components that carry the highest risk and you'll say okay this is uh, this stores most of our patient data, for example. We're going to go ahead and mark it for some more robust testing so we can get an idea of where our weaknesses are and really uh, plug those holes to the best of our ability. Um, security auditing is verification. You can audit your access management policy. Um, you can also use this tied to compliance. And um, you can analyze the system in working conditions you're taking a view of what's going on. You're not, um, the chances of something going offline or breaking are quite slim. 
it, that can happen in a test, in a penetration test, but not so much in a risk assessment. Sorry, not so much in, in auditing or reviews. Um, red teams are similar to a pen test, but it's more targeted and it usually involves more than one person. It is a team of people that are trying to get in using the techniques of a malicious um, person or some sort of threat actor. And they're going to try to get in and access sensitive data as quietly as possible without being detected, just like the bad guys. Um, they're going to just look to avoid being detected. They're usually there for a, a longer period of time than other testers. And they use a variety of techniques. Uh, this could even include some physical testing to break in um, and to get access to things that they probably shouldn't have. Um, the final note here is application security testing. There at some hospitals, there will be some level of development. And uh, this is, would be the process of testing and analyzing and reporting on the security level or posture of a particular applic application. It's used a lot in uh, web development, but also app development, um, like for the, um, for like Apple applications. And it's just an idea, a, a way to test and gauge the security strength of that application and then find areas that you can remediate. So there are times when you're going to wanna to bring in outside help. You wanna develop, especially if you're going to um, have an outside digital forensics incident response team, you're going to wanna to develop this relationship long before a crisis situation happens. So find out how many cases they work a year, how many of them are hospitals, uh, get references or testimonials from past clients, find out what um, experience level their team is at, how many of them have worked in the healthcare industry, and uh, find out if they can help with overall readiness and not just be there when things go wrong. Recently, uh, Liz Waddell did a presentation called Help, We Need an Adult, Engaging an External IR Team that provides uh, some great tips and you can find it online just Googling the name. Um, and here are, here's the beginning of the resources. There are um, CIS, so the uh, CIST and NIST, and then the open source testing manual, as well as links to many articles and demos. And that is the end of our uh, basic network security section. Moving on to the next session. Section. So the question that comes up pretty often is, how do you monitor all the devices you have in a network? And this, will, this is going to start with um, really seeing what you have and then figuring out how to capture that data and monitor what's going on. Obviously, we don't have the, st the resources to, to go and look at every device. Um, so you need to have a smart approach to this. Um, we're gonna to touch on network discovery, logging, and setting up a strategy for um, asset management and real-time monitoring. So as I mentioned, uh, before we get started, you're going to have to do some planning. Um, some of this is going to be with network discovery, you're gonna to wanna to perform a scan to get the lay of the land and probe a network for all connected devices. Uh, institution are going to need to be aware that certain brands of devices or certain um, device models do not like being scanned. And so you're going to wanna avoid doing this kind of heavy network discovery while they're in use. 
or you're, you're going to want to have that dialogue with your medical device manufacturer to see if uh, if you have some of those devices and then perhaps take the device offline or um, create a strategy for managing that device while you're discovering everything else on your network. Um, ultimately, you cannot protect what you if you don't know it exists. And one strategy is to log as much as possible, get as detailed lay of the land as possible. And then if you find a new device that isn't in your inventory, you're going to treat it, treat it as hostile. So you're really going to want to be as thorough with discovery as possible. Um, and in this network discovery, you're going to find uh, some items that are immediately um, glaring. They're going to be operating systems or firmware is out of date. You're going to find just some simple vulnerabilities that come up and you can remediate them along the way as you're doing your asset inventory. You're going to have to decide what's um, important to the organization early on because you can't keep a log of everything. Uh, Long-term storage is expensive in, for this kind of monitoring. So you're gonna have to prioritize what data you wanna keep a track of the most. You're uh, going to wanna structure your log data. Uh, you're gonna have some normalization across logs. Um, there's a common information model that was created to solve this and um, a community, an open source community um, that also provides some information on this. And I have a link to that in my resources. Uh, if you're unsure of where to start or you, or you want some structured guidance, there are many different scene vendors. And so you can reach out to them and see about writing the rules that support your organization devices in these cases. Um, don't feel pressured by these salespeople. Make sure you're in control of your conversation. You're going to want to separate and centralize your log data. Decide what you need from the logs and what you can discard. Uh, logs are similar. Logs are similar to um, or, or find the log data that's important to you. So security logs, system logs, intrusion attempts, connections. Figure out what matters to you, and those are the logs you're going to need um, to keep. Separate logs come in handy for searching and dashboards. Uh, so if you can organize your data in a way that's intuitive to you. Uh, if devices are windows, you may be able to use the window event uh, forwarding to push to the syslog. Uh, if you're using a Linux environment, use existing syslog. If you're pushing to a seam, there's uh, lots of options. So Splunk, Security Onion, Alien Vault, Elk, et cetera. Uh, there's paid versions, non-paid versions. Uh, obviously, the open source ones are an increased level of effort but everything is going to need fine tuning. That is the nature of, um, of logging. So um, you're gonna log devices to ensure communication to only trusted endpoints, log IPs and connections in and out of network, uh, log an alert of large data transfers. You're gonna wanna log uh, local devices and workstations for USB devices that are plugged in. You're going to want to see what uh, log, you want to app, log application setups to what's starting, what's running on startup. You're going to want to search for uh, malicious applications or, or malicious services. Um, there are different options for inventory based on your operating system. Uh, you have a lot of variety in this space. Use whatever works best for, for your workflow. You're going to want to correlate data sources. So you're going to use existing logs and security system events combined with local host, to, local host logs to detect anything that's out of the normal, out of normal and flag it as malicious activity. 
For this, you're going to need to establish a baseline. You're going to have to have a period of time where you are figuring out what is normal in your environment. And once you know what uh, normal is, you can start to define what abnormal looks like. Uh, you're gonna, co correlation only works if your logs have been normalized. So you're gonna wanna use uh, identifiers that work for you as an organization. Be consistent. Whatever is intuitive for your group, proceduralize that and make it standard. So you, for example, if the core group in New York file server one, if you wanna abbreviate just taking the uh, first letter of every major word, uh, if that works for you, do it. Uh, do whatever works for you. You can say MRI, um, diagnostic services, oh, left wing, whatever works for you, figure it out and then make it canon. You wanna label your equipment, include uh, warnings or pertinent, pertinent information. And you wanna also log uh, MAC addresses, model numbers, serial numbers, licensing keys, anything that is important, uh, especially if something goes wrong. So you use uh, those unique identifiers when logging so that you can easily identify in your dashboard what is going on. Um, utilize scripting to run searches on interesting data, send this to email for the process. You're not gonna wanna do this by hand, use a dashboard. Uh, perform real-time perform real monitoring. Again, you're not gonna wanna do this all by hand. You're gonna wanna do, have some dashboard, um, deploy automation when possible and work with your vendor if, can, if you can. If you're using a free version, um, those are often supported by robust communities and reach out to the community. So SIMs are complex to set up and administer, and I understand. Small teams have limited cycles. I understand that as well. You're going to wanna take your time to really um, fine tune this to work for your particular infrastructure and uh, utilize a seam. It'll tie together all the information and make network monitoring easy for your staff. Um, so assets, um, bad guys and the things we can't see are really where we have high risk um, with no logging, no asset inventory and no central logging server, no seam to tie everything else. Um, you're really dealing with a, a issue of the lack of visibility. Um, this is where that strategy helps, where we're tying all of that information to make a map of, of what you have as a network and uh, where your, it's the first step in, in figuring out where your risk is. So here is a fun little map. <laughs> Next, we're gonna talk about developing a patch strategy. So now we're moving on to my last topic, and then we'll close out with Matt on his final two topics. My last topic of the day is medical device patching. This is a complex topic, but we start with everything, like everything else, with a strategy. Um, why have a patch management strategy? It avoids downtime and response efforts, it increases compliance, there's high return on investment for the effort and ultimately in, um, increases the security posture of your organization. There's also some FDA guidance you might want to look up on the topics. Uh, security updates are managed by the manufacturer's quality system, but they have made it um, easier to go ahead and push out to the customer. Um, what is part of this process? There will be um, hazard analysis, formal testing, and then it'll be released. Why are patches generated? Well, sometimes it's because there's a uncontrolled risk that has an unaccept uh, unacceptable um, risk to either clinical functionality or patient safety. Sometimes it's just maintenance um, or part of good cyber hygiene. And sometimes it's that a third party component re requires a patch. 
uh, there's a lot of challenges. One of them being the variety. There are hundreds of possible op uh, options for operating systems. And then when you add in the hardware and software components, um, there's a lot of variety in that, in, in that install base. Um, the hospital network has some complexity and risks. You have a lot of vendors. You know, we like to think you uh, only use us, but uh, that's just not the case. There is a number of vendors. There's a number of platforms for remote access and some devices do not have remote access available at all. Then there's the available, availability of a third party patch. Just because a third party component has a risk does not always mean that it will, they will get us the patch in a uh, timely manner to provide it to you. Uh, and then there's dependencies on the back end, servers and the like. There's organizational issues. So who does this device belong to? Um, does IT have a good relationship with the clinical team? I mean, it, in smaller places, the um, bioengineering guy and the IT guy and the IS guy are probably all the same person. Uh, but it, it depends on, on what, how that person deals with the clinical staff. And then what are the functionality risks? There's also a regulatory and compliance concerns, what the change ma management process, process is. Um, devices are in use 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, device systems, they, like I mentioned earlier, they have dependencies. Um, hospitals are typically not allowed to install operating system patches directly. This is becoming less of a problem as more software-only solutions are created but it is still a problem, especially in your legacy devices and install base. And what is impacted if things go wrong? Patient safety, care, delivery, and you have a reduced revenue. If you have to divert patients, if you um, have to delay diagnosis, you, you're gonna have a reduced income. More complexities. <laughs> The uh, diversity of the medical device manufacturer, service level agreements, a larger healthcare organization deliveries typically rely on automated patch management systems to coordinate the distribution and installation of patches. Uh, these agents for these programs or security agents are not generally approved for use by medical device manufacturers. Automated systems might accidentally push a patch to a non-approved device. And it, that patch might bring that device offline or render it uh, unreliable. Uh, HDOs have a difficulty for monitoring for and assessing the impact of vulnerabilities. Uh, if they may not know that vulnerability exists, so they don't have a lot of visibility into what the third party components are of that uh, product. Uh, many devices can only be patched when not in use or in service. Uh, for patient care and patient safety reasons. And um, for this, I'm saying leverage your existing preventative maintenance cycles for certain devices, but when the device is in use 24 seven, that, that cycle might not come more quickly enough. We hear this a lot, there's a shared responsibility. Medical device manufacturers need to make a safe device and uh, or as safe as possible and give you the avenues to have safe settings um you know control your your access to your device um protect your data respect privacy they need to have robust security features the device needs to be hardened and tested uh, we need to d disclose vulnerabilities we need to tell you what the third-party software is in that in the device and we need to provide patches in a timely manner. Hospitals need to deploy devices in a secure environment, which includes uh, segregation. They need to monitor their network. Uh, they need to have an access management slash traffic control system. So that could be like physical security. Um, vulnerability analysis, they need to do security awareness training. We don't touch on security awareness training in this topic but it is important. Um, and you wanna teach proper use, you wanna have a life cycle and change management policy that includes patching, and you're gonna to wanna to assess your risk. 
So as you may or may not tell by now, I'm pretty keen on processes. Um, asset management is a important part of many of the things I've mentioned, including patching. You're gonna, get, you're gonna wanna give each device a profile where you're saying, uh, you're triaging by exposure, likelihood, and impact in, in your risk profile. So do you have um, a flat network and a device that has a lot of ports open and um, not a lot of security controls in place for that device, your network exposure risk is high. And then you go, you said, yeah, okay, that's high, but it doesn't actually store any PHI. It just may have a couple of, of values that are anonymized. Um, okay, well, then your data exposure is low. Uh, patient safety and clinical care risk, does this directly affect a decision in patient care? Or is it uh, an A1C that may be a factor in a diagnosis or, or a fasting glucose that may not be directly um, directly impacting a clinical care decision in an emergent moment. Um, so how do you create this profile? If it's networked, you can, as we mentioned earlier with uh, the discovery portion, you can collect uh, hostname, MAC address, IP address, wireless in, uh, interfaces. You may also want to note serial number Oftentimes, that is uh, an identifier used by service. So when there is a problem, they may use, uh, there's a vulnerability that impacts serial numbers one through 10, uh, or ending in, in one through 10, and all others are fine. Or uh, we're rolling out a patch to these serial numbers. So you would like to note that information or communication with your device manufacturer. You're going to want to create this, uh, part of creating this uh, medical device security profile is the software bill of materials and your security white paper. So many, many manufacturers are now in the process of collecting this information. As you can tell, the software bill of materials is important for a variety of reasons. Um, it's involved in vulnerability analysis, in your privacy concerns, um, in pretty much everything. Uh, the white paper should also tell you what your operating system is and patch level and update. There's going to let you know if there's any middleware, any dependencies, there's often network flow diagrams. You can get an idea uh, with the documentation that your uh, vendors provide of what your risk is. So when you're creating your medical device security profile, you're gonna to wanna to take a look at the controls. What are the uh, credential management options? Is there uh, antivirus or other security technology available? Do they encrypt? Uh, you're gonna ask what logging capabilities they have and how do they manage remote access? You're going to wanna to keep a copy of the MDS2 security and security white paper for every version of the device that you have in use in your environment. There is enough variety at significant releases that you will need this data. Make it part of your profile. So as I was mentioning, the network exposure is the device and internet accessible, in an internet accessible network zone. Um, does this have dial home capabilities? Is it remote accessible? These all increase your network exposure risk. Data exposure, does the device store PHI or PII? Is the sensitive data only stored for a small period of time or is it permanent? How many records are stored? How is it stored? These are all questions you're gonna to wanna to ask your MDM. They are your partners in this. You are also going to need to figure out how critical is this device to care? Is it life-sustaining? Does this re uh, represent a single point of failure? Has the security evaluation been performed? You're allowed to ask your medical device manufacturer, hey, what security testing has been performed on this device? Um, 
what did you do about it? Um, and especially if this is critical to care, you might want to have those conversations. You're going to need to plan your patch execution safely. So if you can, if you have a test device, you're going to want to, um, one, receive your manufacturer's approval, test it on a device in, that's not in use at all, uh, ver verify that it does not in any way impact the your workflow, um, just so that we know it works in your environment, uh, schedule a patch during the maintenance cycle, so a time that the device will be down anyways. Use your uh, device in use safeguards that are in your manual. Deploy and apply the patch. And validate that the device is ready to return to service. So you're going to want to make sure that this is an approved patch. If you want to, for some reason, apply a patch that did not come from your manufacturer, you need to reach out to your manufacturer and have that conversation. See what your service level, level agreement says. Uh, manufacturers do have a list of approved patches, so get that documentation from them and make sure you're up to date. Ensure that the patch management system can isolate authorized patches and employ, ensure that only your authorized and approved patches are deployed on the device. Um, here's some considerations. You're going to want to see what your change management policy says. Uh, schedule the patch during the prevent and maintenance cycle. I, I can't stress that enough. Please do not use a device that's in use. Uh, should by any accident that happens, you know, you don't want to act, you don't want to take a device offline that a patient is, is using. Um, when impossible, employ device and use safeguards the two-man rule. So, hey, I'm going to patch this MRI machine. Can you see it? Can you verify that this is actually empty and not in use? Because we have it on the schedule that it's not in use today. Yes, I'm looking at it. There's nobody in it, and there's no plan to use it today. Um, you're going to want to isolate the medical device on a maintenance VLAN and then deploy. When everything is back up and running, return it to service. Uh, so that is our patch planning. I know it's a little more involved than your automation, automated uh, patch deployments that you can do with your uh, workstations and servers, but because these devices are so important to clinical workflow, you need to put in this effort. Next up is Matt, and he has the fun topic of physical security. So thank you, Helen, for that uh, great overview on a number of topics. Uh, we only have two more modules left. They should be pretty quick. Um, we have physical security, and then we're going to cover uh, third-party risk assessments and communication. So we'll jump right into physical security. Uh, so why is physical security in healthcare important? Well, if we're trying to protect uh, PHI, um, you know, physical security is, is certainly one thing that we definitely want to consider. Um, if we can't uh, block physical access to the hospital. Uh, individuals can come in uh, and get access, potentially get access to data either on a device or, or something, something of that nature. So we'll quickly look a little bit about, or a little bit at hospital physical security studies that have been done and kind of understand, again, to try to lay, lay that foundation of um, what, what the current threat landscape is. So uh, of a survey that was done in 2018 for physical security in hospitals, 34% uh, of hospitals did report some incidents of trespassing that year. Uh, that was up from two years prior. Uh, and only 42% of hospitals did report having a visitor management uh, system. Now, when I say a visitor management system, what the study defined as a visitor management system uh, did require you to, uh, a visitor to both sign in, have a photo ID, and a visible badge while walking around. Um, so if, if a hospital had two of those but not three, they didn't technically meet the criteria for visitor management system. So that 42% is of the reporting hospitals that had all three. Uh, and 20% of the hospitals uh, actually had some sort of physical man trap that, that stopped um, 
stopped individuals from coming in uh, physically before entering the rest of the hospital. So what do we want to restrict? Obviously physical access, we're talking about physical access to the hospital. Um, but again, if we go back to that first uh, slide deck that we had, we're not just talking about uh, visitors, but we also want to consider staff. Uh, you know, is there certain areas that staff don't need to be in or, or do we just give them uh, access, kind of carte blanche to all areas of the hospital? So we certainly want to consider that. And, and, you know, definitely remember that 58% uh, of healthcare data breaches do involve insiders, both malicious and uh, unintentional. So certainly don't forget about your own staff when we're considering these. Um, physical uh, security plan evolution. So obviously your, your physical security plan for your hospital wants to evolve. Uh, not just with big events like we saw after like 9-11, uh, where a number of new, um, you know, doors and um, walls and things like that uh, certainly uh, were installed to keep um, to restrict certain areas but you know we wanted to continuously evolve as the threat landscape evolves uh, this was a great study uh, this was by uh, Marley McKee or not really a study but uh, Marley McKee uh, she has uh, interestingly enough a couple million followers uh, and she is herself identified as America's modern manners and etiquette expert and she claims that opening the door at work uh, was her number two for uh, top America's top five manners. So th these are things that people should do. Uh, obviously, those of us that work at security realize that this is is really not good. Um, but but it is you know prevalent uh, door holding at least in um, a number of cultures it is prevalent. So we need to kind of look at that and and factor that into our physical security plans. Uh, this was a study that was done by the University uh, of Omaha. It was fairly interesting. There was about 1,500 students uh, that were uh, assessed to see if they would basically hold the door if someone uh, walked up behind them. Uh, Two-thirds of the individuals, if there was someone that immediately tailgated them as they were coming in the door, uh, they would open the, open the door and leave it open. Uh, there really wasn't any gender difference for that category, but there was it was interesting, the, the latter two, um, significant gender difference. Um, females reported uh, seriously significantly lower for uh, both glancing back and seeing if someone was coming and standing there and holding the door and then holding the door open for a significant amount of time. So um, didn't really go into why th there was that um, difference uh, with genders, but um, it, you know, if, if you're incorporating this into, you're incorporating door holding into your physical security plan, might be something that you might wanna look at that study and dive a little bit deeper into. Maybe those gender differences are something that you could leverage to make your, um, sec uh, to make your facility more secure, if you can understand kind of why that's happening. Um, we're certainly not gonna rent, uh, reinvent the wheel. This is a, you know, a less than a two hour training. So if you want to see some, some great physical security um, uh, disc or, uh, training, uh, I definitely recommend Jason Street's DEF CON talk on physical security. It goes over a number of different physical security penetration tests that he's done and how easy it is to gain access. So, you know, again, this is just, this is the very short uh, abbreviated version that's specific to hospitals. So if you want more, I would definitely uh, um, look at that. So why is any of this important? Physical security, we're at a, you know, cybersecurity um, or hacking conference. Why is physical security important? Um, well, manufacturers, so medical device manufacturers, make certain assumptions when they create a medical device. They assume, as Helen was talking in some of our past presentations, that they assume that a device is going into a secure environment. And that's not always the case. It's certainly going to vary. If it's maybe a large, um, you know, CT device that we're they might make assumptions that that's going to be in a secure um, facility or maybe in a secure laboratory, certain devices. But, you know, it is understood that certain smaller like point of care devices that can be physically picked up and carried around or, you know, might be in a um, ER setting or even in a home setting are obviously going to have less physical security. But you just want to kind of be aware of what physical security assumptions, um, you know, your medical device manufacturers are, um, are assuming. Yeah. So testing those assumptions. Um, while I was creating this training, I had the unfortunate but fruitful experience of having an individual that was close to me uh, be admitted to a hospital. They were close. They were first admitted to a local, like 25-bed uh, critical access hospital, regional hospital. Um, 
then moved to a larger university hospital, uh, and then in a number of um, uh, like re rehab, physical rehab facilities. So I was able to kind of, you know, visit regularly and observe uh, different situations that were happening um, with kind of the eye of being a, you know, an occasional medical device penetration tester. So um, I've never done actual hospital penetration testing, though I have some colleagues that have and I've included some of their insights, uh, but this is kind of what I've noticed. So the hospitals that I did visit, um, they did not check my ID, uh, which was interesting because I could have very easily just provided a name of any patient that was uh, in the hospital at the time and been given access. Um, and I actually tested this out. This kind of an interesting OSINT experiment. But if you go to Facebook and just kind of do a search for, you know, hospital, um, in probably 30 minutes or less, you're going to be able to find a name of a patient, uh, you know, whether it's a friend, distant colleague, whatever. Um, that's currently, you know, in a hospital, maybe social media posts that says, you know, this could be Facebook or any social media post. Hey, I had a spill. I'm in a hospital. Uh, this is a hospital. Come visit me. Um, we now know that individuals in that hospital in a good number of hospitals, you can simply go there, provide their name, maybe provide a fake name because they're not actually checking your ID uh, and be given physical access to the hospital. Uh, once you're inside, um, at least I found in the hospitals that I was in, I pretty much had access to go anywhere in the hospital with, with some restrictions. Um, and there were signs that basically told me kind of wherever I wanted to go. So if I was a you know nefarious actor and I wanted to get access to the server room, it clearly showed on the map exactly where that was and uh, it said on the door um, you know exactly where that was. Um, yeah, keep going. Um, I was going to mention one more thing, but I'll, I'll mention it at the end. Uh, at the patient's bedside, uh, there was uh, obviously anyone that's ever visited someone in a hospital, you know, especially if it's a critical case, uh, you know, that patient is surrounded by a number of different medical devices. Uh, many of those devices, such as a, a cow or com uh, computer on wheels, which is where the nurse um, or the clinical staff would sit down and do their documentation. So they would uh, do their vital signs, ask the patient all their questions, and then go to this computer to write notes. Um, typically, for what I've seen, most of these were not uh, locked down, at least in the hospital that, that I was in. And I've uh, installed medical software in a, a previous role, and um, that's certainly not the case. A, a number of hospitals do lock down all their computer on uh, cows, computer on wheels, and have a certain timeout uh, to be able to lock, lock that out if, you know, inactivity. Uh, but in this case, there, you know, the devices were open. Um, that's not a picture of a device. That's just one that I took off the web. Um, and there was a, no a number of other um, medical devices at the bedside that, you know, had USB ports that, um, you know, if you look at the device and Google it, um, I, I, you can probably uh, identify that it doesn't restrict any type of traffic. So if you had a rubber ducky, things like that, you know, you might be able to either extract data out of the device or potentially run a script on it. So um, there's a lot of things you can do once you get physical access um, that, you know, we often think, well, if someone's in the hospital, they're hurt, they need to be there. But, um, you know, nefarious people get hurt too and end up in hospitals or visit family members or friends that are in hospitals. So it's um, kind of something to consider. Uh, one thing that I found interesting, so I, like I said, I've done some um, penetrate, like, a very small amount of penetration testing for medical devices, but I have a colleague that does um, actual hospital penetration tests. Uh, and he says that, you know, with a mop and a bucket, there's essentially nowhere in the hospital that he can't go. Um, anytime he's done a physical penetration test or uh, just a penetration test in general, um, you know, he always, this is what he does for every hospital he's gone into, he dresses up like a janitor um, and they generally give him access to anywhere he wants to go, including secure facilities or secure areas of the hospital. So uh, if you're looking to do physical penetration testing at, um, at a hospital, that's probably a good plan. Um, so health, there was a great talk um, a couple years ago at one of the health ISAC summits uh, that specifically looked at printers as kind of, um, you know, having a lot, basically being chock full of PHI. So they typically have a lot of records. You can do print last 10, you know, especially if this is a discharge printer where, you know, if you go to the hospital, you get discharged, you go uh, sit in front of a nurse, she prints out your, you know, 15, 20, 50 page, whatever. Uh, medical record gives it to you and then you go out the door so that that um, 
printer is like chock full of records. It's probably right next to an exit door um, and it may or may not uh, require authentication. So just something to kind of think of. Um, printers often get overlooked, but uh, it might have just as much, if not more um, PHI than an actual medical device. Access in the waiting room. Um, this was, you know, often we think of, okay, we have to actually get in the building to be able to find a network jack or to be able to get some sort of, you know, access that we need. Uh, but um, Helen, if she's still on the line, had a great story of one of her friends uh, that was doing a phys or was doing a penetration test uh, for a hospital and found network access uh, right from the, the lobby. Oh, if she's still on. I am. So, um we met up before his test because this was his first like hospital test and he goes um i imagine hospitals are are like a fortress I'm like oh no dear uh, they they are not <laughs> and uh he, he's like no no you're you're kidding me and i'm like yeah they're they're pretty bad i would totally expect a flat network so he um has a plan to say that he's you know uh waiting for a patient <laughs> And he doesn't even need it. Nobody asks him. So he just sits down with his laptop and there's a network uh, connection there. And he's like, it can't be this easy. And he plugs it in and, and sure enough, that was, it was live. Um, so definitely interesting as far as the initial gaining of access. Scary. Emergency well, waiting rooms are full of people and um, that aren't necessarily highly monitored as well as lobbies. Lobbies don't always have a receptionist. Yeah, great. Well, thank you for that story, Helen. Um, so, so what can be done about this? Uh, obviously, we could require IDs for all visitors uh, when, so when they're uh, entering a facility, require some visible badge, and it could just be a sticker. Um, it's certainly helpful if that visible badge actually says where they're going, so that you know if, if they're in an area where they're not supposed to be, um, it's clearly visible. Um, restricting physical access to only areas that um, these individuals should be. I mean, I, I've certainly been lost a number of times in hospitals. Just, try, you know, you go in and then you just have access to everywhere. And you, they're, they're so big, you get lost. Um, you know, if you could actually have individuals kind of guide people to where they're supposed to be going to, and in a large hospital, that's obviously never going to happen. That it's just too large and there's too many visitors. But I have seen it work pretty well, again, in like a Midwest, like small critical access, 25 bed hospital, um, where they have a number of volunteers where they're just, you know, looking for something to do and help out. And, um, you know, I, I've been surprised to show up at those hospitals to install software and, you know, had a person that actually brought me from the door to right where I needed to be. So if you're one of those small hospitals and you're looking for something for volunteers to do, that, that might be a, a good thing that they can do to, you know, be friendly with visitors, but also help increase your security posture. Uh, train staff on tailgating and again, leveraging those, you know, if you can leverage the differences and understand kind of why that's happening. Um, you can lock all devices when they're not in use. Require authentication on printers is good. Um, and you know, when we're locking devices too, that's obviously, you know, it's, it, there's, that's going to be a process. You're, you're probably looking at like hospitals that do it well are doing like a tap and go system. So you just, you know, I have my um, card on a lanyard and I'm just tapping it on each device that I have access to. Um, and that's going to look different across your hospital. Certainly in the ER, there's a little bit more risk because you have, you know, people coming into the ER constantly and you certainly uh, guests of people that are there. Uh, or uh, patients, but um, you know, in an ER, like uh, seconds count, so it's it's understandable that there's going to be less restrictions in that setting, where you know, having to have a doctor stop and actually log into a system is certainly going to slow down, and could adversely affect affect patient outcomes. But um, you know, if you can do like a tap and go system or something that is efficient, um, you know, anything you can lock down, certainly the better. Uh, but again, do it, you know, do, do it in a way that. Um, it is, it is useful. Um, again, going back to that application uh, support staff that I was at a hospital, um, if you know you're not, if your staff's not getting paid over the weekend to be on call and they regularly get calls at 11 at night um, during you know, shift change, um, you're basically incentivizing them to open access up more than it should be so that they don't get that call. So uh, definitely try to try to avoid that. And, you know, either uh, asking manufacturers to, 
you know, filter traffic, so doing that in your assessments on devices to see if that's an option, uh, or physically blocking a, a USB port, because uh, certainly it wouldn't be the first uh, infusion pump that was plugged into a patient that, um, you know, crashed when it was uh, actually infusing something into a patient because someone plugged a USB, uh, you know, whether it's something malicious or just a phone charger. Certainly if it has a USB port, someone's going to eventually try to charge their phone with it. So just kind of be aware of that. Um, some other things just to kind of, you know, go with the win-win philosophy, you know, locking down access to a hospital not, not only protects P PHI, but it also protects your employees and patients. Um, you know, hospitals are places where injured people go. That's fairly obvious, but, you know, the reason that they're injured or sick might just be because they're sick or it might be because they were in some violent altercation where, you know, the assailant is now, you know, going to come back to try to do the, uh, to finish the job. Um, and, and we've seen an increase from 2017 uh, in actual violence against, uh, specifically against staff uh, for in U.S. hospitals. Um, it's up 57% in the emergency department and 52% uh, increase uh, outside of the ED. So certainly increasing physical security in your hospital, again, not only helps protect PHI, but also helps protect your staff and your, um, and your patients. So thank you for that. And uh, we have one last module uh, coming up on vetting third parties and talking about uh, communication. All right, so thanks everyone for sticking with us um, for the previous five modules. This is our last module. Um, and this is on third party, third party communication and risk assessments. So this is all about how if you are a hospital and you're wondering how you gather all the information that you need from a, maybe a medical device manufacturer or a third party uh, and incorporate that into some uh, risk calculation to make decisions, uh, purchasing decisions based on that or um, security decisions of, you know, what do I do for this device to secure it on my network? Uh, this would be the module for you. So, you know, again, just to try to set some stats and some groundwork, um, if you're wondering how many hospitals are actually, if you're a hospital that's maybe not doing these uh, third-party risk assessments, but you're wondering what percentage of them do, uh, back to the 2017 HIMSS study, and this is a little bit dated, so it's probably even more so now, but 88% of medical facilities are conducting uh, cybersecurity risk assessments on third-party products, so medical devices and other products, uh, and 38% of medical facilities are pen testing equipment. So if you're a medical device manufacturer and you're not pen testing your equipment, um, certainly be aware that your, your customers most likely are pen testing, uh, or, or maybe at least um, going to ask you and inquire about if you, know, if you are pen testing. Uh, so the po uh, Ponymon study uh, back in 2019, um, just looking at basically how much hospitals actually spend on this, on, on risk management, and an HDO or health delivery organization, just a kind of a big word for a large hospital organization, uh, on average spends about $3.8 .8 million a year on third-party vendor risk management. And, you know, why do they do that? Well, juxtapose that with the average cost of a data breach uh, is about $2.9 million. Um, and if you look at the, just the vast number of vendors that HDOs have under contract, it's over 1,300, which is just unfathomable that, that, that they're managing that. Um, and why they tend to do a really good job assessing all of those uh, third parties initially when they're first looking at them, um, less than 30% are actually annually reassessed. So, you know, it's a, a a big lift and a good amount of work to get them assessed initially, but we're not really looking at them, um, re-looking at these technologies a year, two years, five years after they're in the door. Um, so if there is a concern uh, during this risk assessment process, you know, what happens? What, what do hospitals typ typically do? Well, again, looking at that same, uh, same study, about 21% of the time, the assessment gap leads to the manufacturer remediating it. So the customer says, hey, we, we did a risk assessment. We found this. We're not going to be able to purchase the product uh, unless something happens. 21% of the time, the manufacturer does something to, to fix that or address it. Uh, 3, 33% of the time, the HDO uh, or health delivery organization mitigates the gap themselves. So it might be you know, cordoning off that device on its own segments um, of the network, maybe a separate VLAN um, or some other security uh, um, 
security technique to be able to reduce that risk. And 28% of the time, um, medical device manufacturers should be certainly aware of this, 28% of the time, HGOs just terminate the agreement and say this doesn't, uh, this device does not meet our basic security requirements, so we cannot purchase it. So that is uh, definitely happening in the hospital sector currently. Why are we doing this? What is the risk? Uh, about 20% of healthcare data breaches are caused by third-party vendors, um, either by you know the, the vendor or you know somehow associated to that vendor. What is the cost in labor? You know, again, this course kind of focuses on smaller hospitals, but those larger, bigger um, HDOs, health delivery organizations, how much time are they spending assessing this risk? Well, the average, um, the average hospital or HDO. Uh, has about 3.21, uh, 3 so that's obviously a percentage, um, but you know, over three employees on average uh, solely dedicated to just assessing third-party risk. And if you do the, the math on that, that's about 513 uh, hours a month that HDOs are dedicating just specifically to looking at third-party risk of vendors that they're gonna partner with or vendors that have devices that they're uh, considering purchasing. So can you automate this process? Uh, certainly you can. About a third of HDOs do use some sort of tool to automate this process. Um, there's a number of tools on the right-hand side that you can see. Obviously a, a pretty broad distribution. Um, we're not gonna vouch for any one, but you know, if you have that question, maybe it's a good question for the, the panel afterwards uh, for the HDOs to see what they're currently using. You know, if you're going to do this assessment, you should then have some baseline security standard that you're gonna measure it against. Um, the Mayo Clinic has what they call a gold standard. It's a list of 77 different requirements. Uh, most of those requirements went into the new uh, MDS-2 or the, the, the new um, document that uh, basically lays out uh, security risk, that will, or not security risk, but security features that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and, and Mayo has presented this at a number of different con, um, conferences, so you can you can probably find a little bit more information um, from searching that. Uh, and what this what that allows you to do, it allows you to oh, actually some of the features I should say in that 77 were every device is easily patchable, every device receives timely updates, and you know um, certainly a number of other. Um, facets. And what this allows you to do is focus on the high priority devices, so the devices that have a high risk score, a potential for being you know, a high risk. And, and also what you want to look at too is assess the whole family of devices. If you're purchasing say five different point of care devices that are all different and the risk may be low for each of those devices, but all of those devices um, you know, send unencrypted traffic to a um, like a middleware application, you know, you want to look at that whole family of devices and, and not miss something. Kind of understanding that you know the sum of all the parts, and just looking at the devices individually. Uh, so communication, we'll talk a little bit about communication and how um, HDOs and their third parties actually communicate some of this information. So we talked about the MDS-2, just short for Medical Disclosure Statement for Medical Device Security. Uh, this is a standard form when a medical device goes for FDA approval, 510K approval. This is part of it. Um, so if you ask any medical device manufacturer, should be able to give you an MDS-2 for their product. Um, depending on when that product came out, it might be a different version. The latest version I was talking about that Mayo has uh, their 77 um, requirements, most of them incorporated into, came out in 2019. I think it was November or December, so that's the latest update. So that the MDS-2 is a good place to get information. Security white paper as well. A number of uh, medical device manufacturers create security white papers that offer a lot more information above and beyond uh, what's in the MDS-2. And some of that information, so you might have a full software bill of material, um, includes information like which ports and services are running, or which ports are open and which services are running on the device, um, specifically what sensitive data elements uh, are um, stored or transmitted on the device. Probably give you a network diagram of how the device is meant to kind of live in your, your network, so you can see that. Um, you know, talk about authentication, malware protection, uh, security testing, if security testing has been completed, so if the device has gone through a rigorous um, secure development process, there should be notes on that. The intended operating environment is important because that's, again, going back to those manufacturer assumptions, this is what the manufacturer assumes 
or where the manufacturer assumes that the device is going to live in. So they assume that there's going to be network segmentation and a firewall and a, a you know, number of other things. Um, so it's, it's good to certainly look in that because that will, that will, you'll be able to see the recommendations of how you should secure this device. Um, and network controls, physical controls, uh, logging, uh, how the manufacturer may remotely connect to the device um, for service and whether you want that or not, you can turn it on or off likely. Um, any administrative controls, how to contact um, both service and then maybe the, for a cybersecurity issue, how to um, look for that too. And if the device has any certifications like ISO 27001, uh, things like that. Um, so how do HDOs acquire this information? Uh, it's, it's pretty common. Uh, what they're largely doing is uh, sending us security questionnaires um, and most medical device manufacturers are receiving hundreds of these from US customers uh, each year. They're extremely lengthy, extremely detailed questions. Um, if you are tasked with creating one of these, if you can you know, try to create one in a good format um, that allows manufacturers to just kind of go through and check off or uncheck things that aren't applicable. So if it's, you know, not a cloud product, you can click no, not a cloud product, and it automatically fills in NA to the next 150 questions, uh, and the manufacturer doesn't have to click NA and then put in a comment for each as to why it's not applicable. Um, that would be great. Uh, just some sample questions, you know, pretty standard, you know, um, how do you get this information? Again, I can only imagine on the HDO side if you have 1,300 different, um, you know, third parties uh, trying to, even if each manufacturer has their own information portal where all of the MDS2s and security white papers and SBOMs are in that one centralized location, you still have to go to 1,300 different portals to get that information. Um, there's been some industry attempts to try to have all of that information centralized to one place, um, but those haven't, those have either faltered or have, haven't really caught on. Um, so maybe we'll get there eventually, but um, in the meantime, you can at least, uh, for a good amount of manufacturers, go to one place and get all of the information that you need. Uh, you know, as I said, SBOM, MDS2, white papers, uh, installation guide, you know, any other information, hopefully in that one place to make it a little easier for you. Uh, business Associate Agreement, or BAA. Um, this came from the HIPAA uh, omnibus rule. So this is, you know, basically the, the requirement or, or the agreement between the, the medical device manufacturer or third party that's handling um, secure data or, yeah. So the third party agreement with, uh, with the health delivery organization. Um, one thing to kind of note of that is, is this last line that if you are working with a third party that's uh, offshore or, or outside of the U.S., the Office of Civil Rights or OCR, so the group that's um, tasked with enforcing um, this, it probably do doesn't have jurisdiction. So just kind of something to consider. And if you Google BAA example, there's a number of examples that you can see. Um, you know, your legal department is probably going to um, create this, but just, you know, there are examples. Um, ISA, so this would be more if you're actually handling the customer's data. So, you know, typically it would have an ISA. And again, there's, we could spend a whole class on just uh, creating BAAs and ISAs, but it basically just sets out the minimum expectations for securely hosting someone else's data and follows the framework. Security testing considerations. Um, this has come up a little bit, but um, you know, it, it, earlier in the class, but we just have to assume that these yet yeah, hospitals are pen testing uh, devices. If you're a medical device manufacturer, um, it is a good practice to reach out to the manufacturer before you do the test and just ask, hey, is there any considerations that I might need to know? Um, is there anything that if I do, it's gonna break the device? Um, as Helen said a few times, obviously you don't wanna test in a live environment. Uh, you wanna test in a test environment. And you kinda need to be aware that, you know, there could be adverse reactions uh, to pen testing, but certainly, you know, it is, a, it is a good thing to do. But just, you know, have that open dialogue with the manufacturer so that, you know, you can have the best result of that pen test as possible. And share the findings too, you know, certainly uh, medical device manufacturers wanna know if there's any, um, you know, issues that they could potentially fix. So thanks, that is the class. We do have a little bit extra. Um, so that's all the content. But again, as this class, the focus is 
you know, that one or two, um, either IT or cybersecurity person working in a small hospital. Um, this was, we tried to cram everything into an hour and a half, you know, two hours. And here's a little bit more information on, you know, where do I go next? How do I keep learning? How do I, um, you know, stay current, things like that. So if you're that, again, that one person that doesn't really, that wants to stay engaged, wants to learn more, wants to get certifications, things like that, stay involved in the um, security community. Um, if you're watching this live at DEF CON, you're probably already engaged, but if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, you're, you may not be. So, uh, Obviously, there's traditional coursework out there. Um, you, there's a number of different places or organizations, universities um, that you can take cybersecurity training in. There's not a lot to do specifically healthcare and cybersecurity. Um, Salve Regina University uh, does have a graduate class on healthcare administration and cybersecurity. Um, so it's the only university that I know that has numerous classes in cybersecurity and healthcare and are kind of pairing the two together. Um, there's also the University of Houston maybe have an executive program on it. And Coursera has a class on cybersecurity and healthcare too. But there's not I, too many other. I hear that Salve also has some really cool professors in this sector. They may. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, again, I don't want to hype Salve too much, but it is interesting that they actually have, you know, if you're looking for classes that are specific to healthcare and cybersecurity, um, they're, they're the only organization that I know that are they're pairing those two, two topics. Um, certifications, there's a number of certifications that you can take. Um, Security Plus is kind of CompTIA. Um, many of their certifications are kind of considered entry level. Um, that's, that's a bad thing, but if you're new, that, that's great. Um, the Security Plus is interesting because it's kind of more entry level in security, but it typically requires that you have the CompTIA A Plus and Network Plus before. I shouldn't say that, it doesn't require it, but it recommends it. Um, so that might be more of an entry level or a new, uh, you know, earlier career cert. Um, the HCISPP, so the healthcare, what is it, healthcare information and security and privacy practitioners cert, uh, certification from ISC squared is kind of the, um, more of the senior level uh, certification. It does require two years of working full time in the security field. Um, so that, that's another certification to, to look at. Certainly there's others out there too. Those are just two that we thought might be applicable to this group. Um, there's a number of great free online classes, um, uh, Cybrary and Coursera. Um, I, I didn't pick these. I only picked these because they were listed in the link at the bottom for Tech Radar as the top two. And having taken classes from each, they are good. Um, I will note that I don't know about these two, but a lot of the free classes. So as a professor, I use some of the free courseware in my classes as like sub modules for teaching. Um, and I don't know why, but at, at basically as of like fall 2019, a lot of these online free education courses or programs started putting some content behind a paywall and anything like HIPAA and cybersecurity related tend to, tended to fall under that. So just be aware that some of the content may be free and some of it you may have to pay for, but it may be reasonable, so it may be worthwhile. Um, it may be cheaper to just have all your employees take classes at one of these places and pay for a, a organizational membership to develop your own course. Definitely get involved. Uh, join us in some of the industry groups that, that we work in. There's the Health ISAC. Uh, they have a number of industry groups. Uh, I was leading the Global Data Privacy Group for a while. There's groups on just about everything else. Uh, the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, um, they have some, some great groups on like secure development lifecycle and, you know, any number of other things. There's a, there's a uh, work group right now on uh, training and development that I'm involved in. That, that would be a great one to, you know, get involved in if you're, you're looking at, um, you know, continuing to get um, more training. Uh, and, and there's certainly other groups out there, Amy, you know, a number of other organizations. These are just two that, you know, tend to be popular in the industry. Um, Please don't take any of these as a decisive list of everything that you can look at. Uh, and local security groups, you know, again, if you're watching this live, you're probably also, you're probably familiar with this, but if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, um, local OWASP chapters are great for, you know, monthly meetups. Uh, and then DEF CON, so we're at DEF CON, there's local DEF CON groups or chapters. Um, DEF CON 617 was a Boston group that I was involved for a while, and now, now I'm heavily involved with uh, DEF CON 401. So they do, you know, most of these do like monthly 
that's kind of like a lunch and learn, but they're usually at night um, where they might have pizza and someone to give a talk and, you know, it be a, might be a technical, it might be, you know, it could be any topic related to security. So, and, and it's good for networking, kind of making contacts within your area as well. So, um, and the, one of the good things, if there's a good thing about COVID-19 is that because we're not meeting in person, a lot of these uh, groups are doing online meetings now that you don't have to geographically live close to, like DEF CON 401. If you look at their meetup, they have a number of, um, I think the next couple months, maybe at least two or three months are going to be online because we can't meet in person. So, you know, you can, if you live in an area where there isn't one of these groups uh, and you can't, if you, you go to like defcongroups.org and try to find one in your area, but if there isn't one in your area, maybe at least for the next couple months, who knows how long uh, you can visit one online. Again, if you're super new to uh, InfoSec, this is a good book. Uh, it was free for a while online. I don't know if it still is, but there was a PDF for free online. Um, if you do have to buy it, maybe it's five bucks. But um, yeah, if you do do an InfoSec and trying to figure out how to grow your career, learn more, you know, get certifications, things like that, this is a great book to check out. Some other good resources, um, Micah Hoffman's presentation at B-Sides on how to join the InfoSec community. Again, getting involved. One of the great things about the InfoSec community is that, you know, we're constantly sharing information and training each other, and it doesn't really cost a lot of money, um, which is great. You can just kind of go to conferences for fairly cheap um, and continue to keep learning. Uh, so things to Google, you know, you can Google hacking the skills shortage. We'll pull up uh, good articles on that. Uh, best information security certifications for, you know, insert the year. Uh, five great starter cybersecurity uh, certifications, things like that. will all kind of put you in line of understanding, you know, kind of maybe your next career step. And not necessarily career step of just where, you know, where to go to if you to leave your company and go somewhere else. But if you like working at a hospital, how to keep evolving your skills so that you become a better, you know, defender of your hospital organization. Uh, so we want to keep the conversation going. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Uh, so definitely go get some food, get your favorite brev beverage, <laughs> and uh, we'll be back in a little bit to actually have a panel discussion where you can not only talk to me and Helen, um, but a number of other experts in the field that know a lot more than we do. Uh, and some of them uh, work at hospitals, so they can give you that perspective as well. So let's see. Um, yeah, so you know, certainly reach out again, both in the the the, the um, follow up um, panel afterwards, but also you know, if you have a specific question that you don't want to raise there, you can reach out. Um, here's our contact information. We'll leave that up for a little bit, so you can email us. You know, hit us up on Twitter. You know, however you want to get a hold of us, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you more. And again, take a take a good break and then we'll be back for the panel discussion and we look forward to hearing some of uh, your questions. So thanks for all of everyone paying attention and the questions that were in the Discord channel during this training and we look forward to seeing you at that panel. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for your time.